going to be talking about a topic that I think everybody has some sort of relationship with. Um, it's probably something that everybody has maybe experienced themselves or a colleague um, may have experienced it. Um, and I think what's important and being here in the last few days has really highlighted to me is that we all have uh, different areas of, of engagement um, that we're involved in and I think that this particular topic can reach across all of those areas uh, and I think that's why it's an important uh, topic to start with today. And the other, the other point I really want to make is I really want this to be a learning session. I want, I want to learn some things that we can do um, in the future that we can possibly change in the industry. And I, and I really want to hear from you guys. So I really want it to be a really relaxed environment. Um, please share your stories if you have them. Um, I want everyone to feel really, really engaged in the topic. And um, I want to learn and I want you guys to learn. So um, let's just have a bit of fun. It's going to be very candid because some of these, um, I guess, situations that we find ourselves in as a practitioner can be quite raw. Um, and, you know, and I think that's why we need to talk about this to start. So, we're talking about burnout. Um, I want to just do one one thing. I have um, created an app, and it's called Bexcom because that's the company that I work. Well, I am a big company, um, along with a few others. Um, and so we've got the app, and if you can you can search the app. Um, you don't need to do it right this second, but it's it's got the um, this presentation on it, and it's also got some. I did a survey in advance of this. Um, this presentation um, with some colleagues and I've put some of the findings up on that uh, app as well. You can also get in touch with me uh, and it's got some just some resource material and I was hoping if we could get some really good stuff today that we haven't already got on the app, um, we could feed that back in. So I'm really, yeah, download it if you want to sort of keep the conversation going with us today. So, I'll start from the beginning. What, what are we going to cover? So we're going to, to discuss what is burnout, what does it look like, and what are some of the signs. Um, we're going to have a couple of case studies. I am the case study. I'm going to be using my experience working on major projects and, and um, approaching burnout due to those projects. Um, I'm happy to um, include you guys in, in that journey, and if you have um, experiences of your own, Let's share those as well. Um, but of course, no pressure, so I'm happy to talk about myself. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the issues. So we're going to have an issues analysis and actually break it down. Have a bit of a whinge. We don't need solutions at that point. Let's just talk about it. What, what is the issue? And then we're going to um, have some um, opportunities to, to break out and um, talk about what we can do, some opportunities that we can implement in, in the future. And then also, what does the future look like? So I really want to hear from you guys what, I mean, I've got some ideas of, um, I guess, you know, um, what the, a, a wonderful future may look like in the engagement industry um, that, you know, in terms of supporting us through difficult situations and, and ultimately avoiding burnout. So that's what we're going to cover today. And because it's a learning session, I don't really want it to be a learning session, is it, what, what are we going to leave here with? So we're going to leave here with a greater understanding about burnout, uh, some practical strategies about how you can manage burnout as a practitioner, but also as a leader. So I know a lot of people here are responsible for community engagement teams. Um, so as a leader, what can you do? We're also going to discuss the need for possibly, and I think this is the way forward, um, a framework or some policy um, to protect us as practitioners. We obviously have lots of lots of policy and, and, and you know around our communities and how we engage with our communities. I feel it's lacking in the space that there's not a lot out there to protect us um, and not rigorous enough anyway. Um, and also a vision of the future. Like I mentioned before, I'd really like to get your ideas and understand uh, ideas about what the future of our industry um, looks like and how we can ensure it's sustainable as well. So let's start from the very, very beginning. So we're all clear, we're all talking about... Um, <coughs> so burnout sort of goes beyond stress. You know, I think in, in a way, healthy parts of stress is healthy. It makes us motivated and sort of gets us out of bed in the morning sometimes. Um, but when it becomes, uh, you know, relentless stress, that's when it can become unhealthy. And that's when sometimes we're faced with 
with burnout. So um, I have sort of looked up a, a, a nice, you know, sentence that kind of encapsulates it all, and it's basically it's a state of emotional, physical, mental exhaustion, and it's excessive and prolonged stress. So I think it's the prolonged part that really can start to wear on people. And I think once you've been in the industry for a while, um, it it can it can accumulate. And I sort of look at it as a bit of a um, a weather situation, you know, um, you've got clouds and it might be cloudy and then it gets cloudier and then it gets cloudier and then it gets heavy and then it rains. And that's when you've reached your burnout. So I sort of like to look at it and visualise it like that. And I've certainly been there. Um, so I've got some polling questions, if we can do this. Um, so the first one is, have you ever experienced burnout? Um, if you want to jump on the app, not my app, the um, <coughs> app from the conference. Um, and it, so we've got, have you ever experienced burnout? Okay, <laughs> pretty strong figures so far. 80, 20. Great. Okay, so the next question is... Excuse me, how do we get on to it? Sorry. Oh, sorry. So it's, if you go into my... Sorry, in the yeah. Yep. Yeah. If you go into my... Go into uh, and there's already really... Yeah. Um, so the next question is, have you been concerned for a colleague or a team member with regards to burnout? Again. Wow, even higher. Yep, great. Thank you. Next question is, how stressed have you been leading up to the conference? So let's put us all in our um, frame of mind about looking internally. Uh, how have you been feeling leading up to the conference? I have been really bloody stressed. I've had so much on. Uh, everything is due the week before so I had this. Um, and, and I'm away next week and I have been really, really stressed running around and I know that affects me and it affects my decision making and it affects other things in my life. It sort of starts to infiltrate. So I really wanted to get an idea. I haven't been that stressed, that's good. I'm stressed. I'm, stressed. I'm so stressed I feel burning out. That's not good. Whoever the 11th yeah, well, that's his great right right idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, good on you. Thank you for sharing. Um, now, the last question I've got for polling is how many of you proactively practice self care to avoid burnout? Let's see. Oh, good. We need to be all the time, guys. This is what we're going to talk about today. We need to really understand <coughs> that self care is not it's not a nice to have, it's an essential. And if we need when we're going to thrive in this industry and thrive as practitioners and engage our communities better, then we have to be practicing self care all the time. All the time, build it into your daily routines. And that's what we're going to talk about. Thank you for giving me your your answers. I did a quick survey with some colleagues. Um, via LinkedIn, and I got an awesome response. It's so funny, I put stuff up on LinkedIn, like, hey, we won this job, and I get like one like. And I'm like, I've got 600 people on LinkedIn, what's going on? I put up a burnout question in a survey, I had like 60 responses or something, like, it was crazy. So I think it's, it, it is a topic that people really resonate with. Um, so look, that's just a quick snapshot. I just wanted to get an understanding if I was barking up the right tree. But basically, have you ever experienced burnout? You know, 82%, and that's that's from most of, most of the people that would you know, reply to that survey, not in this room. So we're right. So I want to talk about burnout. I want to talk about some of the causes, and I'm looking at this through a lens of being an engagement practitioner, thinking that we're out there in the public, you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, these may or may not be relevant to you, um, but. I'm happy, I really want to hear what you guys think as well. I mean, these are some of the things that are really quite obvious, uh, maybe not so in my experience. So, I, it, it always comes back under resourced teams and sometimes little investment in training. I've had many, many experiences where <coughs> the, the project directors or, or whoever it is just don't see the value in training the community team, or well, they don't have the money. So, I think that's definitely a cause. Um, look, I've worked on major projects and I'll talk about a little bit of my experience later, but I, I have had the, the unfortunate experience of having that constant criticism from the media. And um, when you're in a, in a role that you think you're doing a really good job and then you open up the paper and you've got, you know, a, a, an article that's sort of saying what a terrible job you you know, your, your project's doing and how you're ruining the lives of the community, and it becomes, you know, once is okay and that's interesting. 
you feel a bit famous, but the, you know, the second, third, fourth, fifth time, it gets a bit old. Um, the obvious one is community backlash, protests, um, you know, unreasonable complaints and personal attacks. You know, we are there to take complaints, to take feedback, to use that to, to make our processes and our systems better. But when it becomes personal, when it becomes unreasonable and, you know, it, 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 it can wear thin. And I think that is a, that's actually probably one of the, the main ones and that's probably why everyone understands. Um, community expectations, I think that makes a big impact on the communities that you're working in. A lot of them will, will want to, um, I guess, have input and, and be truly consulted. And I don't think that there's much left in, in, by way of consultation when it comes to delivery of major projects. I think that sort of, unfortunately, um, is more of the inform, you know, using your spectrum. And I'm, I think um, the community has a bit of a, a beef about that, rightly so. The other one is tight deadlines, lengthy approval timeframes, contractual obligations. How do you be authentic in a contractual environment? It's really difficult. Um, you know, you want to do the best for your community that you're working in, but of course you're really sort of tied down by a lot of constraints and timeframes and sometimes clients and government messaging and, you know, you're getting hit from all, all angles. So I think that's really important one to, to consider. The other one is, um, which I've spoken to lots of people about, but the blame that the community team is ultimately the one that's sort of a roadblock. Um, I feel that that can be a bit of a, um, a negative as well. You know, you want to do your job, you want to get out there and build a project, but there is some requirements that you have to do as a community professional, and, and we often are seen as the sort of the one that's holding back the notifications and holding back the, the process by having to go out and engage and talk to people and things like that. And the last one is, uh, is, is and I think we're all familiar, it's not, um, sometimes we're, it's, we're not valued. The, the process or the practice itself or the team is just, we're not necessarily always valued. So you sort of combine all these in a nice, you know, storm and then I feel that you can often come out with a bit of a <coughs> after many years. So I'm going to talk about my experience. Oh, should I not actually go before I, does anyone have anything else to add to that? Is there anything else that, yeah? Um, I'd just like to say, sometimes you are going into a project and sort of start it. Yes. And so you've got legacy that you need to sort of unravel and problems that you need to solve. Yeah. Is one thing. The other thing is just, um, some, some practitioners are as good as others and they, the faults of those practitioners sometimes creates more problems in this as well. When you're walking into it or, or you, yeah, and they've promised the world and you walked in and, yeah. Oh, no, it's a well, it's a bit sort of the same. Yeah. You can see it takes time. Yeah. So, you know, and that is just crap. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I think the other thing is that there's no longer a nine to five job. There's always on TV. Always your email. You're always on the bank. You're not lazy. You have to always be at work. Absolutely. Yeah, always at work. Always. And you, you finally get home and you think, oh, and then you get a call on the community phone and you put it that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know one thing that that's been in, in Victoria because uh, infrastructure's been taken off, it's really hard to get uh, experienced team members. And that can be yeah. quite a difficult thing to manage as well in Cook's yeah. I've noticed, look, with obviously uh, the, the huge amount of projects going on in Sydney, we're under the same pressure as well. Um, and there's not, there's just not a Endless resources, good resources. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I, like, I agree with all, all the ones that you put on there and the ones that people have, have added. Um, I guess for me, the question is all of those are external. So, there's also got to be factors about how we process those or the expectations yeah. we place on ourselves. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. That, that, <coughs> that determine how we deal with all those external, because that's they're the given. It's actually how we process it. And so this is interesting. I was um, I switched on SBS on Tuesday night and Insight had a whole episode about burnout. I don't know if anyone saw it. Um, and it was really fascinating. They had a couple of psychologists and, and they said, does, does personality trait come into it and personality type? And their answer was absolutely. So a lot of people that suffer burnout are sometimes the overachievers, um, perfectionists. Um, you know, they really, really want to do a good job and I, I can see those 
things in, in myself, definitely. Um, and I think that that was really interesting. I had a sports star and a lawyer and um, I think a business lady and a policeman and they all had these, um, had reached absolute burnout. And it was such a fascinating, so if you can replay it, I suggest you watching it, it's really good. Um, so we'll go on to my case study, but please feel free to, I don't want to just stand up here and talk, so please feel free to, to get involved. But look, I, so I worked on, um, on West Connex, I don't know if everyone's heard of it. Um, it's a major project in Sydney and I worked on the, the first stage of it, which is um, 1D, and it um, was basically the, the sort of first tunneling um, of, of the whole scheme and you know it's a massive project and we were tunneling from um, Homebush to Haverfield in the inner west of Sydney so um, I'll paint the picture and I'm not from everyone's not from Sydney but it's a very sensitive area it's a really really old um, and well established suburb especially uh, around the Haverfield Ashfield area beautiful old homes um, unfortunately as part of that project we had to um, that, that we, we, they demolished uh, 180 homes um, in the middle of a really beautiful suburb. Um, and a lot of those were heritage homes, a lot of those people had sort of lived and had a lot of a, a big Italian community, they lived in that area for a long time, they lost neighbours um, that had, you know, they'd grown up with and took them to the doctors every, you know, every week and, and, and you know, they, they lost a lot of their lifeline. It was a really contentious project. Um, we were the first cabs off the rank, essentially. I walked into a project and I hadn't really managed a big team before. So I was, like, <laughs> so I was not only sort of walking into a, a project that was, um, you know, <laughs> the philosophy of the project people were dead, dead set against. Um, it had significant impact in the community. Um, it was, people were absolutely irate, I can't explain to you how irate, that it was going ahead. And as the, I worked on the contractor side, so a lot of it just really, I mean, I was essentially, me and, and the team were essentially the face of West Connects. And so, um, look, I thought it was really exciting to start with, absolutely, I was like, I can do this. Um, you know, that's fine. And, and my project manager said to me once, he said, you can't start a 100 kilometre bike race or a, a bike race at Olympic level at 100 miles an hour and finish two years later at 100 miles an hour. And I thought, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have it. But <laughs> this is some nice pictures. And I'm sorry if anyone is um, part of this. Actually, like, I, I don't have anything against... Um, that action groups were protesting or using your your right to, to do that, and I absolutely go for it. Um, it's just being on the other end of it, and that's what I'm talking today about today. And I'm absolutely not. I don't want anyone to misconstrue the fact that the community doesn't have a terrible situation in all of this. But today, we're, it's all about kind of turning the mirror on ourselves as practitioners, and so that's kind of what I'm doing. So take that with. So look, I mean, this is what we faced on a daily basis. We had media that were criticising um, our um, that we were corrupt, um, that we the process was flawed. Um, you know, we had uh, many, many protesters. We had protesters that would go into the homes that were about to be demolished, and they'd set up camp in there um, so they couldn't. And, and you know, we'd have to. It was just a, it was a relentless, relentless amount of um, negotiating with that kind of thing. Um, then there was, I mean, obviously there was the, the big face of it, the action groups, but then there was, like I, I mentioned before, there was the, the actual individual impact to these people, you know, they lost their, their neighbours and their, their, um, their suburb was forever changed. So my involvement really, I started to, I started to take home with me. It wasn't as easy as just leaving it at the door. And, and I think if we come back to that, how you absorb it. And at that time I had two young kids that were like two and four and, I was driving from the northern beaches to the inner west every day in Sydney, which is like, you know, can take two hours each way. And I, it just, it was like, it just was relentless. And then I get, you know, sort of get home after a long drive and sort of, you know, I'd been abused by community, I'd been, a, you know, misrepresented in the media. Um, and I had this big team that I was managing. Um, it was under resourced, and we unfortunately had some. I had to sort of strip it out and start again. 
uh, at, at sort of the very beginning, when, which, which is the time that you should be walking in and having like a team of 10 ready to go, but we weren't, we were starting from the ground up. So, um, and then I'd sort of get home and, you know, grunt at my husband and um, sort of, you know, not see my children and go to bed and then, I'm, then the community phone would start and it was, you know, all night and it was just relentless calls after calls and people just abusing you and just getting really, really upset because they had three nights a week of night work in front of their house for the next three years. So, you know, how do you, how do you put a message around that? <laughs> you know, you, you, there's only so many times you can sort of say, we're approved to do the work and take your feedback and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, um, so yeah, look, my, my pace in my race started really high and then it, it did. I was there for two years and it really did and I absolutely felt myself just becoming um, less and less engaged in the process um, and the project and the people around me um, at home and at a, pers at, at a professional level as well. Um, and I started actually questioning and that's how I think one of the warning signs is when people <coughs> say to you, how do you sleep at night? How do you do this for a living? Um, I actually started thinking, I actually don't know how I do this for a living. This is really shit. <laughs> like, we have a really, really bad job. Like, this is, this is, um, maybe I am on the wrong side of the fence here. This is like, and that's when I thought, hold on a minute. I think, I think I'm not thinking as I, I normally do it, and they're just taking an anger out on me. So, that's, that's a little bit of a snippet of my, um, I guess, yeah, into burner, my end, my direction into burner. But, I think you can't just take that on it in a, in, a, in a vacuum. And then I work, I've worked on major projects in, in Sydney and, and Brisbane um, for 10 years leading up to that. So I don't think I don't think you can clearly say that it was that project, but you know what, it was definitely that project that um, that um, created the storm that led to burnout. So, and I want to be really candid about it because I'm sure other people have the same experience. Um, but look, I've got some key lessons learned out of that. And um, so the first one I think it's important is just to understand the triggers and the warning signs. Um, I don't think I did, and I don't think I did for my team either. Um, resource, like, so I would never go into a job now without having it sufficiently resourced um, and ensuring that there is someone from the community or the or stakeholder engagement team in a decision-making place. Um, you know, whether it's on the senior leadership team or that someone that could make decisions at a, at a management level and, and, and actually put them in place. Um, I would gain some more support from someone who's been there. Um, and I think we all need to exercise a little bit of perspective. And my husband used to say to me, you're just building a road. <laughs> so, um, the truth, you know, like sometimes we're not hearing things to hear. Like, it is important, and it's important to the community. It's their lives permanently changed. Um, but, you know, we need to sort of sometimes take a step back. Um, balance and personal care. I was not, I didn't have any balance. I was completely uneven. Um, and I certainly wasn't really practicing much self care. I think I probably went to the gym a lot, but I don't know whether that was just. <laughs> Yeah, probably. Um, and then, and then I think my key learning is out of that as well is just to know when to push back. Know when to push back on the community when it's unreasonable, and when you start to hear about their marriage problems and their death problems, and um, you know, their all this legacy you know issue. I think I think we um, sometimes it's maybe some of the junior practitioners don't know that it's okay to say. I actually don't need to hear that. I'm here to help you with this issue, um, but we can we can we can let the other stuff slide. Um, or if they are getting aggressive towards you, you have every right to say, I'm I'm not engaging in this any further. And you know, if you want to calm down, we can have a chat another time. But now's not the time. Um, or let go. And I think I didn't let go early <laughs> early enough. And I think that um, we have to be really true to ourselves. Like if it's enough, it's enough. If you really need to go and make a change, like make a change. Like I, I think it, we all put so much pressure on ourselves. I certainly put a lot of pressure on myself. I was like, I'm proving these guys right. They've given me this job. I can do this. But in fact, the best thing for me was just to, to move on and have a break. And actually, I left that project. And finally, enough a year later, um, after starting my own business and 
um, reviving myself, I went back and did another year on West Connects on the other stage. So, you know, I'm a god. <laughs> um, so, I've, I've kind of broken it up into. So, I want to talk about the issue. I want to talk about the issue that um, from from two lenses, from a personal lens and then from an industry lens. So I've just got some things here. Please, we have if you feel like you want to have a you know share some of these. But I think um, basically, I think the issue is um, we need to look at it from like I said before, like a cumulative impact. It's not one project. It's probably two projects or three or four, and it just adds up. Um, I think we, what we probably don't do, and, and what I hope to get out of this conversation and many more, is that we give the individuals and leaders in the practice the tools to identify burnout and manage it. Like, what do you do when you can see, you know, one of your team feeling this way or you're starting to feel this way? Like, where do you go from there? Um, I've said it earlier times and I'll say it again, but we have to adequately staff our teams. And I don't know whether that has to be done contractually or it's, it's, it's underdone, it's undercooked. And usually at the beginning of a project when you need double the amount of people, it's always the time that you have less. Um, I think also having a sustainable career as well. So, um, you know, nurturing our upcoming practitioners to ensure that they are healthy that they are, their well-being is being considered while they're doing this job. Um, and again, that goes into training. I think we're probably not adequately training our people, and that's not necessarily the fault of the training. Or it's, it's probably the, the actual decision makers that don't invest in it. Does anyone want to add to that? This is from a personal lens. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I'll stand up. Yeah. Do we need a mic actually? Sorry, anyone can't hear me. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was involved with Dudley Castle, so in the system of Newcastle, um, they put a race track to the facility, and there's around 2,500 clients that are affected. We've got a race track to essentially going past people's bedrooms and the living rooms. So um, I experienced burnout in that first year. I came in for COVID, COVID had already started, and I had to go through the legacies of the previous consultant. Um, one of the things that um, just take, I, I agree with everything that you're saying, and I think I remember a CEO who said to me once, it's funny, the frog that jumps into the water, the water jumps straight out, but the frog that is in the water and the water slowly, slowly heats up will boil to death. And I think that's the experience that I had certainly when I was a frog in the boiling water. The other thing that I, I learned about the training was the effect of cortisol has on the brain. And when you've got too much cortisol in your brain, the decision makes is impaired. So it's quite interesting to see uh, community members and staff that have more effective with cortisol. And they didn't know that they were affected. So it's just a matter of saying, hey, I'm, I'm actually going to, let's, let's, let's regroup tomorrow. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to take the lunch. And I think it's around knowing that that act of going to lunch or that act of going to the gym and those few minutes before you go into the gym is probably the most stressed you've ever been because you can't get that hour back. So how can I afford this hour at the gym? So that it's, it's pushing through that and going, I have to get to the gym. I have to do practice or sleep <laughs> or whatever it is because my decision making post that is actually yeah. better and it's really faster. So mm -hmm. I can totally agree. Yeah. Sorry, no, no, absolutely. Totally Please share. I feel like I'm the one binging out about you know experiences, but it's so it's so important that we share. Yeah. Thanks. I'd just like to comment. I think that's a really great point from both the description rather. One of the things I think might either fit into this or into your organisational one are the other sources of support that are available, particularly when you are dealing with things that are highly, projects that are highly emotive. You don't have to carry everybody's monkey on your back. Um, there are other people who have services to, who are able to, for argument's sake, the example you gave, where people were talking about their loss of family and friends and that kind of thing. 
there are other services available that you can direct them to and to be aware that that's in your toolkit as well. You don't have to carry everybody's money. Absolutely. And I think that's it's the, it's the carrying of this. What if something happens to, what if, it, you know, we get calls at night. I had one resident in particular on West Bank used to ring me at most nights in the team and say, you know, I'm going to hurt myself and kill myself. But it was really, really, you know, how do you, I'm not a psychologist or a, I'm a community engagement practitioner. I don't, what if the person does something and I've been left with this, I'm the last person he spoke to. So we did get the counselling involved, but they're the type, you know, I go to sleep at night after that call thinking, you know, I don't sleep all night. And that's, that, it's, it's that burden that you share, and not one person, but you know, 5,000 stories that yeah. Yeah. what projects were already out there that had funding were either under investigation or under construction and build that into our storytelling. Oh, it's one of these sort of things that we're doing next. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and I, I think this actually adds to those things. I think there's a little bit, the biggest pressure on men comes from myself, but I also think there's a broader culture in our workplaces, particularly in high performance teams, that affects mums and dads. Um, and um, I'm quite fortunate, my husband and I are very 50 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, um, higher low down, oh, I'll be quiet. Um, and so, yeah, so that organisational culture is there's an expectation that success in the workplace involves doing more than is perhaps is sustainable now, considering the fact that we all take on so much at home. Yeah. And I think that affects men and women equally. And I think there is still a bit of a trend that hits a lot of women um, slightly harder. But I feel quite often I can't take a break because no one's taking a break, so I can't take a break. Yeah. And that's uh, kind of a, like a comfortable for myself. Yeah, and actually that's one of the points I make, is leading by example. So when, maybe when we talk about some of the ideas, um, I'm wary of time, but um, is that we do, if we are leaders and we're spooking the fact that you need to go and take time out, personal care, all of that stuff, that we lead by example, that we do leave the office at five o'clock, we do come in late because we've had, you know, a, Constant in the morning, or um, dads and mums included, so everyone feels that they can go and do it themselves. You know, I think that's the that's the key. I also um, put it up through an, this next slide up through an industry lens. I mean, it all it, it, it all intersects, I and mean, it's all very very similar um, stuff. But I think from an industry, why are we all getting? You know, why is it common that that we can approach burnout without anyone sort of watching out for us? And I think it's. It's, it's money, it's money pressure, time, you know, um, big, big projects. You know, we've got multi-billion dollar projects um, and the, the, the cost is very real. You know, if, if no, people are like consulted on time and um, material hasn't gone out in time, you know, you miss a five-day notification period and then you've pushed over into a, you know, you missed a, a traffic switch, you missed advertising deadlines, um, all of a sudden you feel like you are carrying literally a million dollar target on your head if you miss it. And I think that's those those big projects kind of lead to that. Um, again, community expectation, inform versus consult. I think um, some of the language I know used um, a lot of the government contracts that I see um, from the regulators say, you know, you must go out and consult. And I'm like, well, you know, consult on night work respite. Well, there's not very much option there. That night work respite, you, we have a job to do. We're allowed to do three nights a week. What are you really consulting on then? If they say, I don't want it, I'm still going to go ahead. That's not consultation. You're just informing these people, really. So it's a bit of a, um, the, the language is sometimes not measuring up with what we're actually doing for these people. Um, I, like a big one, I think, is outdated comms methods. Um, I know on big government projects, I know we're pushing towards that digital communication, but we're not there yet. Um, we're still putting paper notifications in a letterbox, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of notifications in a letterbox. Like, it's so unsustainable and it's so okay. You know, I think we need to start pushing for policy around um, mutual obligation between our communities and ourselves that if they, you know, we've come and door knocked and we've tried to attempt contact half a dozen times and you haven't signed up to the the app or the email list or whatever it is or the phone number text messaging to say that there's work happening, you know, I, I feel that there's a mutual obligation for both, for both the practitioner or the, the project and the community, you know. Um, the other thing is obviously not having a seat at the table, which I've talked about before. Um, and I think the other thing that I find that can be a little frustrating, and please chime in, is we don't, um, when there is unreasonable complainants getting around, they sometimes jump from um, agency to agency. You know, they'll, they'll make a complaint with the EPA, and then they'll make a complaint with the project, and then the client, and then the you know, department planning and all these resources and all this time is taken up to just to deal with this one and what could have been classified early on as an unreasonable complainant and um, we're not maybe that sort of um, across, you know, um, agency communication. I think that's still got a lot of work to do. Does anyone have any feedback on this, this slide? Yeah, go for it. the process, you go through the whole process, you engage in the community, you get a bunch of rich information, you write a report, I'm oh, sorry, you write a report, submit it to council with recommendation, and they go, 
yeah. and make their own decision, shallow project, give you hundreds of notices of motion. Um, and so you actually, like the colleagues Didn't that I work yes. <laughs> yes. 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 the colleagues that I work with, you know, they just want sometimes just want to do the bare minimum because they're probably get shelled anyway. Yeah, or or the you know council will just do whatever they want anyway. It doesn't matter what we go as the community. Yeah, I think that's a really really good point. I'm really wary of time, and I wanted to get you guys to do an activity. <laughs> I I've got some stuff here, but I'm not going to go through. I want to hear from you. <laughs> Let's do just a handful of good ones. <laughs> Put your hands up if you think you've got a good idea. Yes. <laughs> I'm just saying about how, um, like, I used to work in a lot of projects, so you've got to go in and you get yelled at and spat at, and, you know, being sort of a bit younger there, you've got to think like you need to take it. So I think it's really important to set some you know, key messages or have a real brief with your team beforehand to let them know, as you're saying, that it's okay to say, no, I can't deal with this. So to equip them with that skill really early on, yeah. because otherwise they walk into it and they take that burden on and it's too much to handle. Yeah, so and they just don't realise. That yeah. they don't need to, and you're under no obligation to get abused to yeah. walk away. And the other thing is, if you don't have you know, confidential council line, like we have one at our work that you can ring up and use, and you can you know, have a chat with someone who's struggling with whatever it is at work, if you don't have something like that, then I think you should be able to find something and really promote it to your team. I'm just really encouraged to use it the other day, and I think it's fantastic. So yeah. put something like that in place. That's great. That's really good. I'm um, sorry, I think there was someone down here that... Um, I got a microphone, can I do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm still going to have a Oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to share something that I have. Um, my background is in actually political campaigning. Um, so that's working 18 hour days for six months, nine months, 18 months, and time is the only resource you don't have more of, right? Um, but what got me out of that mindset was I realized I was putting more value on the projects than on myself. Um, and I was actually quite disempowered from my own health um, through that mindset. So by reframing myself as having greater value than the organization that's how i was able to finally feel empowered to to take action or have that responsibility so um so yeah so just a, a maybe i offer that to everyone as a way to frame it that's great okay yeah uh, yeah that's oh. <laughs> um oh, we just talked a lot about um the emotional load um any thoughts of sharing with the team and getting involved earlier in projects that often it's too late and the ability to influence and the pressure is there on the comms team. Um, and then just around pushing back and setting more parameters, but you know, training and having good sort of processes and procedures so that you're not kind of just, I think we, we kind of underestimate the um, exposure we have to the intensity of like people's rage as well. Like, and you're just going back out, you almost become desensitized to and what you take on sometimes, so yes. you don't really check in with that, and then you just keep going and going and going, and then it's like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, so many times you get yelled at on the phone, and you get off the phone, and you have a good, like, session with the, the people that you work with, and you can kind of break it down and have a laugh, but sometimes it stays in there. <laughs> I had to mic first. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just want to stick with the self care that most people are actually talking about a bit further. Um, I actually think it's really important to even write it down on a piece of paper or a computer and stick it to the wall where you see it every single day because I think we, we keep on making the same mistakes because we never find ourselves as important as what we're often working on. And that could go from you know setting your boundaries around the hours that you're supposed to work, but it could also go as far as telling your manager or your or people that you work with what your boundaries are. Um, and I think you need to set a reminder for yourself, a visual one for me because I like visual of what I told myself. Yeah, I, I <laughs> absolutely. And when you get busy and you're stressed, you go, oh, I'll do it. That's okay. Later. Yeah. <laughs> and we can't do that. Um, I've got some, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, so about the uh, one for all the parents, uh, sit down with your partner and have a chat about the expectations for work, who has the biggest work lab coming up in the next couple of months, and who's going to be the lead parent for the next period, whether that's a month or the next year or six months, just so 
put the expectations and plan that together. You are partners in life, so you should actually talk together about it. And one very specific outcome is that as well. If the father is the lead parent, tell the school that they're going to call the father first. <laughs> So the school called me, like, they tried to call my wife, like, four times, she was in meetings the whole day, and then said, like, oh, we couldn't get hold of your wife, so that's why I called you, and she's like, yeah. so my husband, yeah. what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> 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 so, and the system is a big no So mine's more from a leadership point of view in engagement. Um, so a lot of organisations are developing wellbeing programs. So I think it's really important when you um, start on any project to tap into your organisation's wellbeing programs if they have them and understand what that means for you and your group and your team. And if they haven't got a wellbeing program, then maybe challenge them on how they're going to develop an OHS or wellbeing program that will look after the emotional, spiritual, physical and, and um, mental health of um, your team as they go through this project. I completely agree. Um, really, really good points. Um, I was going to do a... Oh, I've got some ideas here, but you guys have, have got it sorted. Um, I sort of see it as a time situation, you know, like, like that, that Olympic pace. Um, um, the, you know, if you're looking after yourself on a weekly basis, you're looking after yourself on a monthly basis and then annually, sort of taking some of that big picture um, look at, at what you can do and, and give yourself some perspective. So I sort of see it like this, and if you can do this every time, or every week, every month in your schedule, or put it in your diary like you said before, um, I think that it will pay, play a big part in it. I was going to talk, we, we are short on time, we're going to go about four, um, Four minutes and 39 seconds, and I was going to no talk... Stress, no stress. No stress like that. <laughs> Time pressure. Oh, they're too long. Okay. Um, <laughs> I uh, was going to talk about leading a team when, the, when you're feeling that, um, that burnout. Um, I did, on West Connects, did have a, a team that really suffered through burnout. They, um, you know, a couple of people in particular just found it really, really difficult. And we did some, so some of the practical things, actually I'll just go straight to the, you know I was talking before about the, the phone. The phone, bloody phone, everyone has that experience, right? So the phone, um, we were taking it a week at a time in the team. And we would literally have seven days of people not sleeping, and it's just completely unrealistic that you can even function after that. So we started doing things like taking it one night a week, um, and then you just have a whole night. <laughs> you don't sleep, but I, I insisted, 100% insisted, that they didn't come in the next day or the next morning if they had had a disturbed sleep. Um, we also implemented if they had it over the weekend, they could have a day off uh, working from home, I should say, um, that week. Um, I led by example, I, and I did it because I wanted them to do it and not feel guilty about it. Um, so yes, yeah, so look, talking about the from a team perspective, like as a manager, I think it's really important. Um, the reason maybe that we contribute, you know, it, it, it was a factor in the team. Um, they were inexperienced, and we talked about that earlier. In that, there's a ton of projects going on, and there is there just isn't that experience level with these practitioners. Um, I think specific to West Connex, but obvious to other projects as well, is that sometimes we're just really unprepared for the level of backlash. And from all angles, from, from you know, political backlash, community, media, it just comes at you at all angles. Uh, obviously, angry community, and then long hours, little flexibility, like we said, um, it leads to high staff, staff turnover. You know, it's, it's just a recipe and a kind of a bit of a circuit, sort of downward spiral. So yeah, so look, I'm having, let's just have a really quick chat about how we can be better managers um, and better industry leaders when it comes to this sort of stuff. So um, I think we've talked about it, we've probably talked about most of these, but pushing back and learning and teaching the younger practitioners that you can push back and that it is okay to say, I'm not comfortable, I'm not having this conversation any longer, I am going to hang up the phone unless it becomes a productive conversation, I'm not, I don't accept being abused, being told terrible things happen to my children, all of this, all of the above that have had that experience. Um, 
again, resources, 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 insist at the beginning that our teams are properly resourced, even if it's at the beginning and then they scale down, but it has to be at the beginning. Um, training and mentoring. So our big thing is I don't think we, um, it's really difficult to get a mentor because we don't have a lot of people in a similar um, environment necessarily to say, hey, look, you've gone through this. Can, can we stay in touch and um, can you be a bit of a coach or a mentor and we can sort of share the load? Um, and I think that's kind of where I guess it's important to, to come to a networking event, to come to a conference and talk to people and say, okay, you're all experiencing a similar situation. I encourage flexibility, um, certainly, and I led it by example um, in the team. Um, and I learned my team's love language, I know that's a silly word, but um, I just kind of worked out what they what, what they got a lot out of. So was it going and um, doing an extracurricular activity, you know, they're interested in ISCA or sustainability or they wanted to do a schools program or, you know, like something different that was outside of their job, their job description um, and encourage that. Or was it time off or time with their family, um, you know, that kind of thing. And, and we just kind of focused on that. So. If anyone has anything else to add as a leader, yeah, go for it. Um, I worked on a project about 10 years ago where we actually, because um, we have with Rose Comms team, so just as you were describing, you folks go to the office 9 to 5 and then take home the community phone, be all that all night, and then go back to work and be there at 9 to 5. That's how the reconstruction team works. But on this um, project about 10 years ago, I don't know if Blair or Lawrence is still in the room today, but um, she actually came on with our night um, comms person. So she just did the night shift. And so, and so she would be at the side office and would be answering the phone and also, you know, writing notifications just on to emails and doing do her normal work, but doing it at night. And she was a mother as well with young kids, so she would be there for the school runs and she slept in the middle of the day. So that was a really good thing for her personally, but also for us because we, she wasn't then required to get up in the morning and, and work for us. She was just on night shift and that was her role and she was more on the project to do that. Um, and I think that was a really cool way. And then the day crew managed their day crew and she was a night crew, managed her night crew. And it, and it was a good balance, and I've not really seen that replicated on other projects since. You know, most people are required to take a phone home and then get up and do a long work the next day. I don't even know how that's allowed. If you think about it as an engineering project, yep. if you're an engineer you're working on a night shift, you have to have a certain amount not let that person go back to work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. And that's why so there's a problem we don't have a U. We don't have a policy around it, and that's what I'm talking about. We don't have um, anything. That's, that's solid that we can refer back to and say we're not allowed to, and I think that's what we need to change. Yeah. Yeah, but um, earlier in my career, someone told me about the ritual of after an event of transferring from the role you play in a community environment and then transitioning to your home life. Yes. And like whether that's, you know, having some sort of way of, you know, having a shower and changing clothes or, you know, just doing something that helps you. Yeah. Actually, part of the survey I did with my colleagues was um, someone had written that very thing. They had a certain point where they drove home um, that they looked at and said, okay, now I've left that behind and I'm going home. And that was their physical thing to, to move yeah, on from. I guess that is difficult though when you've got the phone and it infiltrates you and it infiltrates your sleep and your family life. You know, the amount of times my husband's lying there next to me and gone, oh, is it that guy again? Like, you know, we're like, there's like three people in our bed. <laughs> about some opportunities um, for change. Um, so, look, I'm, I'm happy to keep the discussion going rather than maybe writing it down, but I've kind of got some here. Um, I think it is, a, in, in any of this, I guess, in any challenge, there, there lies an opportunity. And I think that we, um, as smart, capable practitioners, that we need to start looking at these opportunities and working out how we can actually make some of this happen. So, um, I've got, you know, asking asking a question, and I'm asking you guys, like, what we want the industry to look like long term. You know, if if, the, if it's a flash in the pan thing that people just simply can't sustain these jobs, um, we need to put some things in place. So um, it's having a realistic conversation. Um, it's also improving the tools that we use and advocating for those tools. I think as well. So like sort of digital and um, easier. Communication tools. I think face to face will obviously be very vital and will never change, but I think there is an easier way to communicate fast 
um, and efficiently with our, with our communities. Um, and I think this ultimately is going to make us engage with our communities better. I mean, if we're engaged, empowered, fulfilled, um, you know, practicing self-care, then we're going to be better practitioners and we're going to be, you know, our, our communities will be happier. We're going to lead our teams, I think it's a, yeah, an opportunity to lead our teams better. Um, so, I mean, I'll put it up to you. Is there any other opportunities that you guys see, see in this discussion? Okay. Is there an IAB2 mentoring program? Good question. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. <laughs> there was a mentoring program that was um, trial string for the practice, um, and that will be evaluated, and then we'll have a look at um, where to go with it. One of the things I wanted to make a reminder of one of the things on the board agenda is actually a wellbeing policy for the sector. Um, which hopefully can add a bit of you, not not not, not, not a capital you as far as the union, but you know, like what would be some standards and policies for for professional practitioners. Yeah, I think that's an excellent. So we're going to use all your feedback. Yeah, we're going to grab the feedback. Yeah, in my ass. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so and again, look, we're probably running out of time, but what does the future look like? Like you know. From you, what, what do you think the future looks like? I have some ideas. I've talked about it. Policy, um, uh, some measurement as well. I think, that, and that's actually probably a good thing for IAP too. Is is measuring our, um, our our practitioners' well-being? Um, and I've I've written up there like a broader approach to the definition of meaning and engagement is the fact that our communities are engaged, but we're all burnt out and hating life. Is that is that the feeling the spectrum with engagement? Like, I, I don't think we need to actually consider that as a, as a fact. But, um, and then obviously, I, I think I talked before about mutual responsibility um, with our communities in that if we've attempted contact and, and they aren't interested in being contacted for, you know, I, I think there has to be a mutual responsibility and it can't kind of lay us. So has anyone else got some good, yeah, some good things that maybe the future may hold? Well, no, it's, actually, it's actually a current it's actually a current resource that everybody has available to them and Emma can come testify that I'm not scared of saying this to the whole community in a community forum as well as clients. There are statewide and national workplace bullying and harassment policies. You guys are in the workplace. There is a legal obligation on your, on your organisations to make sure you're not bullied or harassed in your workplace. Yeah, so there's an existing policy that they have to legally apply, oblige by, and I apply that policy to community members too. Yeah, disagree with us all you like, but 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 people in this room are in their workplace, therefore they need to abide by the federal laws. And Joel said it explicitly at the beginning of our contentious workshop to set the frame, and people immediately took all the heat out of it. You mean that a, like a, a community like a forum? forum? A community forum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Workplace bullying and harassment. And if you have a look in there, like the, the, some of the language of, of those policies are quite explicit. So, so actually, companies have a current legal obligation. And I know. Look, I talk about policy, and um, I think it's a it's an agency probably again approach to that cross agency um, discussion, but. Um, you know, we had some instances on West Connects where we did write a letter to the stakeholder and say we're no longer engaging with you, you've been unreasonable, um, and we cut it out. But I know that's not a, that's not a holistic, um, that's not held across all the agencies and regulators, so that's a case-by-case -case basis, but I'd like to see that become a policy and normal, like, yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to also say I think practitioners should get some um, training on mental health and what it looks like and how it presents. So you may think you're dealing with someone who's normal. Um, I was lucky enough to my mentor is a doctor, a medical doctor, and he trained me into understanding the behaviours of mental illnesses and what how they present. Once I knew that, I had quite an objective approach to how I dealt with that person. And prior to that training, I was quite subjective um, between my own values and on how that person should behave. Once I look through the lens as, oh, this person actually has a mental or physical or mental illness, 
why a coach that has trained dramatically and that really actually want to be that Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if anyone has any thing else to add, I'm happy to hear to share on that but I think I think we've all got a lot to do um, together to and, and this conversation um, needs to continue past today uh, and I'm really glad to hear that IP2 is doing some, some further work on it and I think um, you know I guess my involvement I you know in, in what I do um, and running my business I'd like to keep the conversation going but if you want to get in touch with me like please please do um, and Look, I've got some just, just final comments and, and just a reminder that um, you can download the app which we've produced for today and it's got some um, practical tips and tricks in there. Um, we will add some more stuff in there and um, you can just search it on, it should be on Apple. I know some of the Android ones are taking a bit of time to catch up, might be the issue, but, um, but get in touch with me anyway. I'm happy to, yeah, to, to give you um, a copy of the presentation. I just wanted to add something. This is something I do with my mainly junior staff, but also some senior staff. I think it's important to remember when somebody's being aggressive to us or rude or just a complete bastard, they're actually yelling at the plan. They're not yelling at you. And I think with one of the tools that I've developed over the years is to deflect it. When they're yelling at me, it bounces off because it's that plan that they're yelling at. And actually, I mentally see that when they're doing that, and it actually takes the stress off me, and I see the stress transfer to the plan. So I think if there's one thing we can tell people who work in that is to deflect it off you, bounce it over to whatever it is they're actually angry about, because they're not angry at you. They're angry at that thing. So you've got to remember that it's not you, don't personalise yeah. it, and that just helps take that yeah. pressure off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, any final comments before I let you all go? Thank you so much and thank you for sharing your story.